Hey folks, my name is Tim Collins. Welcome to my Jazz Vibraphone channel. And today I want to talk to you about really one of the solos that got me interested in playing bebop. And this is one of the classic solos by the great Milt Jackson. It's from the 1954 recording of Bag's Groove. This, of course, has Miles Davis on trumpet, Thelonious Monk on piano, Percy Heath on bass, Milt Jackson, of course, and the inimitable uh kenny clark on the drums it's super swinging it was really my introduction to playing real jazz blues changes prior to this i really didn't have much knowledge other than maybe pentatonic scale or playing like blues scales and blues riffs this particular solo really got me started on the inner workings of how the secondary two fives work, how the passing diminished chord works, and just Mill Jackson's incredible phrasing and touch on the instrument. So what I'm going to do with you today is we're going to listen to it together. Then I'm going to go over to the instrument and break it down and show you how it works. We're going to do the first two choruses of this solo. Uh, I believe it's 10 choruses long. So, you know, if I did the whole thing, this video would be an hour and a half long. But as it is, we're going to try to do a deep dive on Milt Jackson's solo. This is take one from that famous record with Miles Davis. <laughs> It's just beautiful. You know, a couple of things that always, I always am drawn to the bouncy feel of Percy Heath's walking bass line. It's just, it's so relaxed. And, you know, Kenny Clark is swinging, just swinging like there's nothing more he'd rather be doing. Uh, and then also, actually, the sparse way that Monk plays the chords in the background. It's so subtle, you almost even don't notice that he's playing chords at all. Hello, do you want to be in this video? And it gives all this room to Milt Jackson to just sort of float over the top of this just warm, comfortable bedding of that walking bass. Every note is clear. You know, you can really clearly hear every note in the bass line. The ride cymbal doesn't cover any of it up. The chords that Monk plays are basically on the one or the end of four, and he's not really even doing anything very rhythmic. He's just kind of staying out of the way, and Milt just takes the limelight and it's beautiful. So let's go over to the vibraphone and uh, see if we can't break this down a little bit more. All right, so now we're over on the vibraphone and we are gonna take a real close look at the first two choruses of this solo. Let's listen to the first four bars, I'll play it and then I'll explain what it is. <laughs> All right, it's a great phrase that goes like this. A one, two, three, four, one, two, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. The first part of it is just these three notes, F, G, and A flat. He's playing them in swing eighth notes, but because they're grouped in three, we get this hemiola effect. And he's also putting an accent on the G more or less every time. So it's and then he resolves it on that E flat. Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Super cool. Another thing that's interesting about that is that even though the chord there is an F7 and then a B flat seven and back to the F7, he's playing the A flat all throughout. So even when the chord technically is F7 with a major third, He's still playing that flatted third, and it, you know, it has a blues feeling because of that. Really cool. Then in the fourth bar, we have this. That, of course, is a 2-5-1 to B flat. C minor 9, F augmented triad, which goes in the place of the F7, and then landing right on the, the root of the next chord, which is the B flat 13. All right, let's listen to the next four bars. Here we go. All right, 
so that phrase goes like this. I'll play it a little slower. One, two, three, four, one. Very cool. So B flat seven, remember we had that two five that landed on the B flat, but instead of playing a B flat seven arpeggio, he actually plays what looks like an A flat major seven arpeggio. And what that really has the effect of being is the root seven, nine, 11, 13, and then back down to the fifth. That's just a very common bebop way of playing a dominant seventh chord. You sort of imply that it's actually a B flat 13 sus and then resolve it even within the bar. Now this part is basically a bebop scale coming down the F dominant chord, even though we're still on a B flat uh, seven chord there. And then we get this thing. So that's basically a B diminished. Remember B diminished is the same as A flat diminished. It's the same as F diminished, D diminished. It's a symmetrical chord. And so he just started on the F with a half step approach and then half whole, it's actually just half, uh, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, and then an upper neighbor approach to the fifth. And then right there, that's an F major triad in second inversion, right? Fifth root third, upper neighbor tone to the fourth. And then we have, There's a couple of ways you could look at that. You could look at that as if it's just kind of playing off an F7 arpeggio, right? It's, it uses these notes, A, C, E flat, and F very prominently. And that's an enclosure. But because the chord there is A minor seven flat five to D seven, you could also analyze it as if this is the root of the A minor, the third, fourth, and then that's the flat nine and sharp nine on the D7 chord, the, the dominant sixth chord. And of course it lands on the B flat, which is the third of the G minor, which is coming in the next bar. A fun thing that I like to think about for that last phrase as well, this bit. So again, you're gonna, you, you hear Milt play a lot of that phrase, this chromatic triplet between the six and the five, starting with the flat six. Right, and if you just look at it from the perspective of an F dominant chord, it's like the six going to the five. But because we're going to G minor, it actually kind of has a double meaning. It also sounds like G minor, G minor blues. And that's one of the things that I find really cool about that line. It works on both levels. Super swinging. Let's continue. One, two, three, and... So, the last four bars are played like this. One, two, three, four. A lot of cool stuff in there. So, G minor seven arpeggio. It's actually just a G minor arpeggio in second inversion, and then kind of walking down the uh, G Dorian scale there, or F major, if you want to think of it that way. It doesn't really matter, it's just those notes. But then we get this. Our theory tells us, okay, we have a two, five, one, and that is where the five chord would be. So that's gotta be a C7 chord, but he plays this shape which looks to me like a D flat major seven. It doesn't really matter how you analyze it, but the effect is that this would be, we would call this a flat nine. This is the four, this is the flat 13, and that's the root. So if you do that, we end up with this C seven flat nine suspension sound because of the F, right? So, and then up here, we get the bottom, very bottom four notes of the C altered scale. Going just from the sharp nine to the third, to the sharp nine, to the flat nine, to the root of the C7. But then by then it's changed to an F, which is now the fifth. And then we get the exclamation point. 
I love that phrase as well because he plays it with such emphasis and there's such a dynamic contrast to the other phrases. You, you really notice that there are certain notes that Milt likes to make pop compared to other phrases that uh, are maybe more, you know, to just sort of like bubble under the surface. There's a real energy and rhythmic flow behind these phrases that's really nice. This, by the way, I would just call an F major six. With this upper neighbor. So we're going four to the three, but with a chromatic. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It's also because it's that second triplet of the one, two, da 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 that gives it such a nice round and swinging feel. And then the last phrase, the last little riff that he plays, I actually consider that more like a pickup to the next phrase, but we'll look at it here. It's an F major six chord in first inversion with a half step approach. So you, that's one of those things you want to be able to do it left handed or right handed, left or right. All right, let's listen to the first four bars of the second chorus. One, two. So that goes like this. The first part is just F minor again. And then that, this I would consider being kind of part of an F minor pentatonic. And then again on the B flat seven in the next bar, we have the, exactly the same phrase that he played before. Right, outlining that A flat major seven shape, which is actually seven, nine, 11, 13, then back down to the fifth. Then we get this, which is a, uh, you know, upper neighbor chromatic enclosure around the fifth on the F seven. And then that's another Mill Jackson classic phrase. We, we're on a F seven chord, right? And he goes five all the way up to the four and enclosure to the third down the triad landing on the seventh, which is then the third of the C minor, and then we get. So again, we have this chromatic note between the six and the five. That's a real common thing to see in Mill Jackson's playing. He uses it everywhere all the time on major chords, dominant chords, minor chords. It's really one of those flexible bits of language that he puts in such a tasteful way into his solo. So here it's an F13 chord, right? So the, if you picture a voicing that's kind of like seven, root, three, five, 13, and we just do the chromatic triplet starting on the flat six. And of course the grace note at the third to give it a blues. All right, that's the first four bars. Let's keep going. So let me play that phrase slowly. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. It, the first couple of bars are really just F minor pentatonic, you know, adding the second in there with a grace note to the minor third. That's the hardest part to count out loud. And then on the very end of that third bar, we get that A natural, of course, because we now have the A minor seven flat five to D seven. And it's almost the exact same phrase as previously. Right, again, we see this, this chromatic thing between the D flat, D and the C. Lands on the third for the final uh, D, G minor chord leading into the end. Let's listen to the end of the solo. It's almost the same exact 251 line that he played the first time. Again, we have So it's got the same basic shapes. We get this G minor that's within the fifth and the third. Uh, I believe the first time he played it with a G, this time he plays it with an F. And then again fills down the scale. This time skipping down to the D and then again this D flat major shape 
which gives us that C7 flat 9 sus sound. And then again, we get the C altered scale at the top with a chromatic approach to the fifth, to the root, and then third with an upper neighbor tone. So that whole phrase again is this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. Hi. Are you enjoying yourself? <laughs>